artificial intelligence is going to solve all our problems, or so we're told. Machines will outperform us, replace us, and eliminate human error. But can machines really tackle the complex tasks that take us years of experience to master? My name is Daniel. I'm a lecturer at Cranford University in remote sensing. I look at the science of extracting information from imagery that comes from satellite, aircraft, and drones. Information about the Earth's surface and how it's changing. Can a machine do my job faster and more accurately? How about your job? How many of you are worried about being outperformed by a machine? Will your jobs even exist in 10 or 20 years' time? Can I have a show of hands? All those people who think that they'll be replaced by a machine. No one. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see if I'll change your mind. The story I'm going to tell you starts at a workshop for showcasing new technology in remote sensing. I was sitting down to lunch with some of my fellow attendees, and we were talking about the conference and some of our own research. At the time, I was working on a project looking at opium production in Afghanistan. So there I was, talking about how to spot poppy fields in satellite images, when one of my fellow attendees sitting across from me said something that took me by surprise. He said that my problems were trivial. He said, soon, there will no longer be any need for subject experts. Artificial intelligence will make them obsolete. And he gave me a concrete example. He said he'd already trained a machine that could detect aircraft in satellite images. So I sat there, a bit stunned, and I thought, OK, airplanes, long, thin, pointy cylinders with wings, pretty distinctive, right? Not nearly as difficult as poppy crops, which can look different in every image. They can be small and sparse, or they can be broad leaves with big, colorful flowers. They can also be just stems and capsules shortly before harvest. I was quite skeptical. I'd heard claims like this before, and the guy didn't really have much experience in the field. But it did get me thinking, what if he was right? What if we really could hand over all our work to machines? What happens if this new technology replaced all subject experts? At the time, terms like big data and artificial intelligence, or AI, were not as widely known as they are now. Today, this idea that a machine can do a job better than a human is a hot topic, and we're starting to discuss, as a society, what this might mean, for better or worse. So what is AI? What are we actually talking about? If you're all imagining Arnold Schwarzenegger as a motorcycle-riding, shotgun-toting Terminator, you're not too far from the truth. AI is a broad concept that a machine can solve a problem in a human-like way, as if it has intelligence. The way this broad concept of AI is made into reality is through what we call machine learning, <clears throat> which is the technology that allows a machine to learn to solve a problem for itself instead of us telling, us telling it how to do it. This is what my friend at the workshop was actually talking about. I like to think of this as the expert versus the data approach. The expert, for example me, studies the problem and designs a solution based on their knowledge and experience. With machine learning, we feed all of the data we have about the problem into the machine, and it learns a solution for itself. The advantage it has over us is speed. It's much faster at doing the computations and working out the answers. It also has no preconceptions about the problem. It might even learn something that we didn't know. My friend at the workshop had trained his machine using lots of examples of airplanes, and now it was capable of detecting them in any satellite image. So this idea about expert versus the machine was in the back of my head for quite a while. But it wasn't until I read about a new type of machine learning that I got really excited. It's called a deep neural network, and it's capable of detecting objects in photographs. It's like a computer version of our brain. <clears throat> and it, it looks for the patterns in images that identify real-world objects, the things in the picture. Much like our brains take visual clues, such as color, shape, texture, and association, to interpret what we see. This technology has already been used to tag your friends on Facebook and to search for images online. When you type a uh, search term into a search engine and it brings back images, many of these will have been labeled using a deep neural network. It's not looking at the words or the text in the image or in the, in the web page. It's actually looking at what's in the image itself, and it's really good at it. 
the network looks for patterns in images that identify these real world objects, <coughs> such as the patterns and the shapes and the colors, etc. You and I know what a frog or a, a cat or a car look like because we see them in our everyday lives in all sorts of dis different situations and contexts. But how would an expert approach the problem of telling a machine how to identify a frog or a cat in a photo? Well, a cat has eyes, whiskers, and a mouth. But there are many different types of cat, and some of these distinctive features may be hidden. Same with frogs. They're different sizes and different colors, and they can be found in all sorts of different contexts. <clears throat> the network is able to break down these patterns using a simple process called filtering. So those of you who are familiar with an image filter will probably be using social media. So the image filter enhances an image, usually improving it in some way to make it look better. <clears throat> For example, if we take a series of edge filters and we apply them to this frog, we can start to see some of the distinctive features of the image. Here we can clearly see the eyes and the legs of the frog. The net neural network is made up of many layers of these filters, all built on top of each other. The result of all this filtering is a prediction for each of the objects that we're trying to predict. It's a score, and the sc one with the highest score is the winner and is the prediction for the photo. <coughs> How do we, but when we start, the network has no knowledge. All of the filters are created using random numbers. They do random things, and so the prediction is also random. In order to get the network to predict what's in a photo, we need to train it. How do we do this? We train it using examples of things that we know the answer for. We feed these into the network, and we work out how far the prediction of the network is from the correct answer. We can then tweak all of the filters in the network to give us a slightly better prediction. Each image the network sees, it will get, a, it will get slightly better at predicting. This process of learning is a bit like firing an arrow into a target. Each, uh, every time we take a shot, we can measure how far our arrow is from the center of the target. And then with our next shot, we can adjust our aim. And we, over time, our aim will get better. In the learning process, it takes thousands of images to get a good prediction. But all the hard work is done by the machine. <clears throat> Essentially, the machine learns the rules by itself. This brings me back to opium poppies, or the problem of detecting how many there are, or more specifically, the area of land under their cultivation. Why is this a problem? Are they hidden? No, not really. They're one of the major crops. All of the light green fields in this image are fields of opium poppies. But going to these fields is difficult. It's not practical. It's dangerous. The fields are inaccessible, and some of the areas are just too remote. A satellite image is a good alternative. It gives us a snapshot of a wide area at a single point in time. We don't, also, we don't have to go there. Whatever you can see in the image you can, and you can detect, you can also measure. However, getting a good estimate of poppy cultivation requires a very accurate estimate of the number of fields. There are expert systems that are capable of detecting these fields, but they, they miss all the difficult cases. All of those confused fields that they, that they confuse other crops, they miss. They might also miss fields which are poorly established. And all these edge cases add up to a lot of error. So instead, the data for Afghanistan's opium surveys is collected by good old skilled human interpreters, trained individuals who go around image by image drawing around fields of opium poppies on their computers. Painstaking work, highly skilled, but, uh, and also subject to extensive quality control. Also a fantastic data set to test the hypothesis that a machine can be trained to do the job of a human and outperform the expert. So that's what I did. I built a deep neural network, and I fed it with three years of data from Afghanistan's Helmand province the largest opium producing region in the world. Thousands of fields from hundreds of man hours of managed interpretation. I started by training it on data from one year and testing it on examples that it hadn't seen before. I then added another year 
and then a third year. Each time the prediction got better. In fact, the network was learning from examples across all three years of imagery. The more data it got, the better the prediction, even for images from a different season. Essentially, learning from experience. You can see here how well it worked. All of the purple fields are fields of opium poppies, and all of the um, yellow fields are fields of cereal. <coughs> so was the guy at the workshop right? The overall accuracy was around 88%, which is high for an automatic method, and it beats all previous attempts at an expert system for poppy detection. However, it did make a few howlers. This river looks a lot like opium poppies to the machine. And that's because it hasn't seen a river full of sediment before. There are no similar areas in the data used to train it. In fact, it missed something that is obvious to a human. You, you don't have to be an expert to, to know that that's a river in the image on the left. The network is limited to things that it's seen before. The past of a problem expressed through the data that we've collected and trained it with. It can't adapt. So what did I learn? Will the machines replace us? The machine's a great help. It can do repetitive tasks much, much faster than we can. So yes, some of the interpreters will be out of a job. Can it replace them completely? No. It can't be trusted to get something right that happens outside of its experience. It has no initiative. And the results of Afghanistan's open surveys are important. Errors have consequences. They can affect international drug policy and they can also affect the lives of Afghanistan's people. This is just an example. But the same is true for any decision that uh, requires us to make, a de to make a human decision. And it poses the question, how do we know what is safe to hand over to the machines? How about your jobs? Are they safe? Can, your, can you be replaced by a machine? Thank you.